Welcome to Talking Jazz. My guest today is Christine Kaur, bassist and vocalist extraordinaire and actually talking to me from Denmark because that's her home these days. And Christine just released a new album. So we'll talk about some really, really cool tunes and arrangements. Welcome, Christine. Thank you. It's great to see you. So just to get to know you a little bit for those who don't give us the little quick synopsis of the California girl. I grew up in Montana, moved to California, met Ray Brown, recorded, life happened, was on the jazz cruise and met my Viking. You can never say no to the Vikings. After a year and a half of long distance relationship, we decided to get married and I moved to Denmark 10 years ago this summer. And that's right. You had a really great Ray Brown relationship, but tell us a little bit about that too. Yeah. Well, I met him while I was in graduate school going to the University of California, San Diego. And he played every year there. And we do in the jazz tradition, you know, you're, you're always trying to help the younger musicians while you're doing the music that you make. And Ray was very kind to me. And we did a recording together. And he mentored me and I got some lessons, good conversations and just hanging out as the tradition is changed my life. Well, and just even going to the concert that I went to, it was just like blew my mind, like just to feel the air move in such a way, just sitting right in front of the band. It was the first time that I was I felt it in that such a visceral way, not playing music. You know, and that's a good point. I mean, that's definitely something we're missing right now. And we talked about that, that it's a four dimensional experience. You hear, you feel the air move and you sense what's going on. And, and we're trying to recreate that. And in that sense of community where you remember the people that you're sitting next to when those things happen, mm. you know, because you're the, looking at each other going, oh my God, did you hear that? Did you hear that? That is so cool. You know, and then you want to bring somebody to the concert the next time. And that's how it is. We get inspired by the music and we can't help but talk to people. I mean, we're all fans of the music, even whether we play or not. And being fans of this music, we just can't help but bring people into that circle with us. First one, we're going to listen to Super Califragilistic Expialidocious. Huh? So obviously this is a popular Mary Poppins selection and, and your whole album is, is focused on taking some popular unexpected tunes and arranging them. And I, I love this arrangement. This is gorgeous. It's not this me ish at all. I almost didn't get it done. I was playing this gig kind of like an annual thing that I do at this little venue on the island of Bonholm. Mia Yort, who books the job and runs the place. She's so awesome and she loves good stories. It's kind of our banter now that when I come back, she's like, well, next year when you come back, you know, I always bring a different guest artist with the band, but then I always bring her an arrangement. First year it was anything from Mary Poppins. And so I had gone through and looked at all the songs. I'd forgotten that she had requested it. And then a week before the gig, my husband's looking in the calendar and he says, honey, what's this with Mary Poppins and Born Hall? I went on YouTube and I was looking up every version that I could think, searching to see if I could get any inspiration. And I had been kind of listening to some Joshua Redman, like Jazz Crimes and some Eddie Harris. Saw like every version of Supercalifragilistic. It's all the same. You know, that um did a little little um did a La, 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 la. So between like thinking about like the um diddle, I started like kind of looping the um diddles in my head and like thinking, well, what if instead of doing it on the downbeat, um diddle, little, little, um diddle, um diddle, um diddle, I don't. And then because the melody is so constant, how can I maneuver the chords around it within like that rhythmic pattern, kind of like this abstraction of Joshua Redman's jazz crimes, which I am sure he would hear no similarity. <laughs> Felt like this, you know, in my head, you know, kind of like this is what I think is a really exaggerated idea. And then it just comes out as this other thing. It was really fun to kind of play with the rhythms of that and really follow the rhythm of the text rather than keeping it in a 4-4 four, four sort of thing. The guys in the trio looked at it and was like, what are you doing? But it makes sense. I think ultimately it, it really does make sense with the text without not making it too childlike, making it so intellectual that lose the feeling of the song. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. I would say let's listen to it. And then I do want to talk a little bit more about the ar arranging process because that's really fascinating. So let's have a listen with that setup. The melody is there, the melody is intact. Everything around it. 
is new. <laughs> this is super califragilisticexpialidocious. And it's from the new album What If that was just released March 26 on Double K Music. And it features my guest Kristen Korb on bass, Magnus Wirt on piano, Nor Kirk on the drums for this track. Here we go. <laughs> your tongue there's no need for dismay just summon up this word and then you'll have a lot to say but better use it carefully or it can change your life one night I said
That was super califragilistic, expialidocious, the famous Mary Poppins song, arranged in a new version on the album What If by Kristen Korb, who is my guest today. All the pieces on the album are in new dressings and new versions. And we just talked about your process of listening to many different versions and then finding an idea to hang on. Like in this case, it was the groove that worked and just starting to replace the emphasis on, on how you phrase it. And then of course, finding new harmonies is all, always part of the process. This next one, is going to be a popular Barry Manilow tune, Copacabana, and we all hear it in our minds right now. This one I almost didn't get done because I struggled with it for about a year. The week before the concert, I had no idea what I was going to do for it. I wasn't going to call Mia and say, I, I can't do this, but I had talked with the guys and I was like, I got nothing. And then we were on this drive home from Reba, Denmark, back to towards Copenhagen. It's about three and a half, four hours, depending on traffic. And I just put on my Spotify playlist and listen to all kinds of different things. So, you know, I grew a band called Four Wheel Drive with Nils Lankain and they had done some pop stuff in a jazz style, some really interesting arrangements on that. But I just kind of listened and looked out the window at the nature. And by the time I got home, I knew it had to be done. The story itself is very dramatic. So I really wanted the intensity of the song to grow through the mm. saxophone solo. Mm. And then of course, in that last verse, it comes back down again because it's 30 years later and Lola's still in the same dress and faded feathers in her hair and all that. It's tragedy. It's gotta end with a drum solo. So yeah, I decided to make it a waltz. Sure what else to do? That whole notion of keeping it in the four for me made it feel too disco-y. And lyrically, the syllables fall really well on a waltz feeling, three, six-ish sort of thing. And then just extracting the changes, not doing a whole lot. The most I did on the chord changes was during the solo, because I really don't like like the dance break but I reference a little bit and then take it through a couple of modulations a couple small turns Karl Martin Amqvist on the saxophone just plays his buns off on it and then my friend Aron Serfati who's a Venezuelan living in LA he just finished building his studio with this COVID stuff and he called me and we were talking and Corb I built my studio. I want to record. I want to do something for you. And I threw that song at him because I thought, well, let's see what you do with this. And he put in all this cool stuff and he heard, and I wasn't even conscious at the time when I did it, we had worked together for a festival in Peru and there's the Afro-Peruvian groups, the festejo. And he could hear in the baseline that I was hinting at the festejo. So he brought in the cajon and really built upon those festejo grooves with what we were already doing in that three. So it's kind of this three against four. Of course, with the tension in that adds to the drama. I think Barry Manilow would like it. That's really cool because, you know, as you said, if you have something like in that era, disco was prominent and then it's really hard to pull it out and get that recognition away from it so that was a great solution just to say go away and do it in three and change the meter and but it's it's all about the story and i think it brings a new focus on the lyric because I hadn't thought about it so much before. It brings that out to me. All right, let's have a listen. So this is Barry Manilow's Copacabana reimagined in three with added saxophone by Carl Martin Almquist. And this is from Kristen Korb's new album, What If, released in March 2021. She was a showgirl with yellow feathers in her hair and a dress cut down to there. She would merengue and do the cha-cha. And while she tried to be a star, Tony always tended bar across the crowded room. They worked from eight to four. They were young and in love with each other. Who could ask for more? At the Copa, Copa Cabana, Hottest spot north of Havana At the Copa, Copa Cabana Music and fashion were always the fashion At the Copa They fell in love His name was Rico 
he wore a diamond. He was escorted to his chair. He saw Lola dancing there, and when she finished, he called her over. But Rico went a bit too far. Tony sailed across the bar, and then the punches flew, and chairs were smashed in two. There was blood and a single gunshot, but just who shot me at the Copa? Copacabana, hottest spot north of Havana, at the Copa, Copacabana, music and passion were always the fashion at the Copa, she lost her love. She lost her Tony now. She's lost her mind at the Copa Copa Cabana, the hottest spot north of Havana. At the Copa Copa Cabana, music and passion.
That was Copacabana, a Barry Manilow song in a new version by Kristen Korb on her new release, What If. Kristen is telling me all kinds of stories on how these songs came together. The first two were based on her relationship with the concert promoter. And even though the overjoyed that we're going to head to Stevie Wonder is not, I still want to hear the story about this concert promoter who loves stories. She's actually a drama person. She loves theater and all that. So, you know, she really into stories and lyrics. Yeah, she's got lots of these requests. By the time I drive in, even before we've played the concert, she knows what the next year's assignment will be. But every time I think, okay, well, I solved that puzzle. And then she'll throw something else at me. It's a really unique gig. I've never had one quite like this, where it's on this very small island and they've got these artist quarters like little apartments. And so it kind of becomes like band camp week. You know, the guys can come and stay for the week. We stay for a week and the concert is like on Wednesday. We do the first Wednesday of August. We can have band dinners because they've got like little outdoor decks and a little barbecue. And my bandmates are a little younger than I am. So they've got little kids. So the kids are running around and playing with each other. Morton, my husband and I, we throw down and cook because we love to cook and we feed everybody. After the kids get put to bed, then, you know, we'll go and play through tunes and play a concert together. And last year we actually played outside because of the COVID restrictions, but it was even better because we could have more people outside than we could inside. And the island is super beautiful. So it's lots of nature, lots of room for people to explore and be in the water or go hike or go take a bike ride and the music is just another beautiful layer on that whole experience being together and eating meals together that really creates special bonds more than just being on the bandstand and putting the music together but breaking bread together and sharing those experiences <laughs> makes it much deeper including the families in that even takes it a whole other level so that way when we are on the road they know like okay okay, who are Kristen and Morton and how are they as people? And so we really care about each other as kind of a larger extended family. And we're so lucky that we get this in our careers where the work, it's work, but it's so much more than just punching a clock. I mean, it really is about taking care of people, whether we're taking care of each other on the bandstand or trying to create music that touches and heals and makes a difference in other people's lives, not just our own. And in order to make a difference in somebody else, I mean, you have to share your positive experience so if you're in bad shape that's difficult to do the overjoyed stevie wonder song it became a five treatment and we'll hear bass solo i for me like with everything else it seems like the other songs with mia's request those songs tended to get denser you know like with either extra instruments with percussion mm -hmm. um although there is some percussion on this it's very light i really wanted this song to be much more translucent the five actually came came because of a Dado Moroni recording that I heard of him with Max Ionata, Italian saxophone player. They mm -hmm. have an album called Two for Stevie, a tribute album to Stevie Wonder. I love the way they did it in five, further stripped it down. So we don't really do much of anything. I mean, in the five, I didn't want to do it in five just because to do it in five. I feel the conflict of you know, are we just trying to over-intellectualize red people saying, you know, if I hear another jazz standard or pop tune, just put in another time signature, I'm going to scream. Because I think sometimes that stuff can be stretched way too far. My hope is that when people are listening to it, that you just hear the story. Mm -hmm. You're not going, oh, that's in five. You know, my hope is that it just feels really organic and it just gives a little more room to breathe. Let's have a listen. This is Stevie Wonder's Overjoyed and Kristen Corp arrangement from her new album, What If, on Double K Music, released March 21. Here we go. Come true. 
That was Overjoyed from the new album, What If, by my guest today, Christine Korb, who you heard on bass and on vocal. And so far, we heard arrangements of popular, familiar tunes that you mostly did. And we'll keep going in that vein. This next one is a, a James Taylor tune, Don't Let Me Be Lonely Tonight, and it gets arrangement by Odmaru Ruiz. We always think of jazz using the great American songbook. Mean, meaning it has to be songs before 1940 to, to be real songs. And I, there, there's several, there's many that have spoken out about how we can stand still and we have to move forward and use all our song repertoire. Is that maybe a little bit in your thinking too? Yeah, well, and it's music I grew up with. It's songs that are just kind of, it's around. And, and I think it's important to reflect on stories that we can relate to. And I love the Great American Songbook. I mean, I still draw on that a lot and other tunes that are more like jazz standards rather than great American songbook. But I mean, that was American popular music. I don't think there's any, I mean, jazz, I mean, there's no rules. As soon as we start making too many restrictive rules on what should be or what shouldn't be, you know, Duke Ellington didn't even want to be called a jazz musician. He just played good music and wrote good music. I think the, the more we can bring ourselves to music in general, whether it's classical pieces or popular songs, it's great. And that way people can hear something that they think they're familiar with, but in a new light. Just like great comedians show us our own, the little things about ourselves and our tendencies as human beings, but in this new light so we can find humor in it, in our habit. Right. And and I agree. And, and it's been the role of jazz always to be a music of the process, meaning taking your experiences, individualizing that and sharing in new ways. And that, that's what drew me to jazz, you know, got me excited. Yeah, I can like do something with this. I'm allowed. I'm allowed to go into the process and, and, and see what happens and mold things in a way that, that I see it. I mean, the, the, the biggest test is, can you be yourself? And I mean, that that's really the whole marker of it. It's not, can you play piano like Duke Ellington or like Mel Dow? I mean, nobody can be better at being you than you. And I think that's just such a cool thing that this is a music that expects us to be ourselves. Actually, I appreciate that because sometimes it gets a daunting task. You have all these incredible musicians and you think, I, I could never play like that person. I could never play like that person. There is a space because you have, you bring something different and something unique to the table that that person who can just play 10 times faster cannot. I was listening to a podcast the other day, Renee Brown, and it was talking about infinite thinking. Mm -hmm. And and I really feel like jazz is the infinite game. It's not a finite game. And just like you're thinking, like if to be better than somebody else, or there's always going to be somebody that can play more notes or can play faster or can do a million things that are different. But the idea is, you know, to be our, our authentic selves, play with honesty and clarity. We work on our technical things so we can tell our truest stories without having the the things that get in our way with technique or, or those things that would maybe um, confuse the, the statement. It's a good point. And thank you, Jazz, for allowing that. So yeah, let's see what how, how you approach it's a gorgeous arrangement of James Taylor's Don't Let Me Be Lonely Tonight. And of course, that's a very deep story anyway. Uh, Mara Ruiz did this arrangement and I actually found out about it because I was playing a, a gig with Aron Serfati. Uh, the percussionist I was talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a drum, wonderful drummer and teacher at University of Southern California. And he and Atmaro have been friends since they were like 12 or 13 years old in Venezuela. And Atmaro is a fabulous pianist and arranger. He's done an arrangement for me before, but I was playing this gig on a visit to LA with Aron and Atmaro and Aron had asked me to sing on this. Mm. And I just fell in love with the arrangement. When it came time to putting these tunes together, I was like, oh, I have to do this one because it's just so beautiful. And Carl Martin on saxophone, he's you know, the vocalist side of me loves it when horn players come in and consider their contribution like a harmony part instead of just playing a bunch of notes because there's sometimes you play with guys and solo all over everything, which is cool. And can be very exciting. But in this song, it's just so nice that it feels really like it's that conversation between two people at two o'clock in the morning that's really vulnerable and sensitive with kind of an underlying compassion in it too. I think that's the best setup to get going on this and listen to that compassion. So here is Don't Let Me Be Lonely Tonight, the Kristen Korb version of the Otmaro Ruiz arrangement of James Taylor's song 
on the recent release What If on Double K Music.
That was Don't Let Me Be Lonely Tonight, a James Taylor song in a new version on the new Christine Corp release, What If? And I, I see where the title comes from, What If? Change them and, and put them in something else. But you know, something I wanted to ask you also about, you are a vocalist and a bass player. Sometimes in jazz, the vocalists take on a different position than the instrumentalist. We have a crop, some doing it both. There's Esperanza, of course, uh, Nikki Parad, probably some others that I don't think of at the moment. I'm curious how you balance the getting the vocal status, meaning you be, you are in front of the band, you have to tell the story versus the bass player part. You're actually the backbone of the band, you know, putting the foundation and, and looking at everybody. And I don't sing, and although it's always expected, but I'm always curious about it. You know, I feel like it's one of the best positions to be in. The few times that I've sung and not had a bass in my hands, I mean, there are pluses and minuses to it. I mean, there is a certain freedom that I can think more about, you know, other lines that I want to sing or explore the music in another way. Boy, having the bass in my hands, really, I can really feel where the band is more. And I, that may be because like, I really pursued part of, you know, a good part of my career just as a bass player. Singing was kind of that extra thing that if, you know, I knew I wanted to develop that within myself, but I also wanted to be respected early on as a bass player for those relationships of looking over the ride symbol, you know, and loving listening to piano trios, you know, Oscar Peterson and Chick Corea and Ray Brown's trio, Jeff Hamilton's trio, you know, those kind of groups where it's that really tight big band in a trio. So when I'm, actually in front of the you know in front of an audience instead of being back by the left hand of the piano like in that Oscar Peterson setup I like being more towards the front of the stage so that way visually then it, it kind of makes a little difference that way but I'm still really close to everybody so I mean if there needs to be any changes I just kind of turn my head and the guys I mean we've been playing together for eight nine years now so if I do a little tilt in my head one way or the other or I just raise my chin it's like all right here we go so I can still communicate with them in those ways yeah you know, musically I just try to divide and conquer as much as I can do you feel there's sometimes a maybe a perception difference of being the vocalist rather a bassist role or thought about it I mean I just like this is just what I do so I don't really you know and this and the vocal part is is only one little part of it so like like I sing the head in and out and if I improvise, I may scat, but I might take a bass solo or maybe there's some combination of the two, but I mean, really three quarters of the song, I'm the bass player. So I'm just not, I'm not wait. I don't have to wait for everybody to be done. I'm in it the whole way from beginning to end. And I love that. And that's a super good point because usually, you know, if you see the dynamics of a band, the vocalist gets to play the melody and then needs to step away. And usually when you perform with the vocalist you're always worried that if you take too long solos you know you make them wait too long and everybody's just waiting for the vocalist coming back but that's a huge advantage that you just part of the band whatever happens happens and whenever that time is grab the microphone and if one of those things like you know like i forget a lyric or something or you know if something goes awry between the singer and the bass player in my head and there's a short circuit i always know where i am so the bass can tell everybody else where rare moments where something might go uh, amok or you know or if I've decided to take the a lyric out and do the second half mm -hmm. I mean my guys are really good they they actually know the lyrics so if there's anything where a second lyric goes out they always know where that is so yeah we can't buy love we can't buy whatever but we can work with can't buy me love and transform it into this new orleans boogaloo blues and just jam along right absolutely yeah and matthias oh I, it, yeah the whole idea was just just have fun and i love a good new orleans groove i love that boogaloo feel that it's just it gives like this party atmosphere you know no matter what put that groove on something and it's a party it, i think it's a nice way to close out that cd because it's just it's so much fun and then matthias heiser on harmonica he is so great he's in his 20s i mean he's 
this phenom on the harmonica. He's he's his own thing. He can do the bluesy sorts of things, but he also takes it to this whole other space too. And there's a lot of voice quality to it. And it's probably the closest, you know, it's right on your mouth and you blow it. All right, let's have a listen. So this is Can't Buy Me Love, the Beatles classic in a new version, Dance Along. This is on the new album, What If, by my guest Kristen Corp, released in March 2021. If you say you love me too I may not have a lot to give What I got I'll give to you Cause I don't care too much for money Money can't buy me love Can't buy me love Everybody tells me so Can't buy me love The kind of things money just can't buy Cause I don't care too much for money Money can't buy That 
was Can't Buy Me Love from the new album What If by my guest today, Kristen Korb. And she tells me there's more to come. This is just half of the whole thing and half of the whole concept. So explain a little bit how that whole thing works. So as I was looking at and putting together this project in general, two tracks, basically. I had those pop tunes, but I also had like when I've been playing concerts, when I was playing concerts, I was integrating a, a lot of, you know, like jazz standards within the sets. So I was really starting to develop like these two parallel tracks, standards and the pop stuff. I had seven tunes on each track mm -hmm. and I thought, well, you know, it could be one big CD or it could be like a double disc. And when you self-produce, you can do whatever you want. So I don't have to worry about a label saying it has to have X number of tracks or it has to be so long or whatever thinking about like the digital market we thought well what if we do the, the pop stuff first and then on the 21st of, of April we're going to release a single that'll be on the next CD and that'll be out in May so like digital release wise there's what if from March why not in May but in May when that comes out it's going to be a double disc. So it's like you flip the CD over, you flip the, the casing over, what if, and then if you flip it over, then it's like, oh, no, it's why not? No, it's what if. You know, great, some interesting arrangements. In retrospect, after looking at everything put together, I feel like it's a little bit of a, a six degrees of Bray Brown. This August, I'll be celebrating 25 years since that Introducing Kristen Corp with the Ray Brown Trio came out on Telark. When I listen to the tracks, Again, all the stuff that I got from him, you know, that swing or die, come out the gate, swinging hard. Those kinds of things are happening on that. There's some Brazilian stuff. There's a Dave Frischberg tune, Zanzibar, which is great. On my Ray Brown CD, we did Peel Me a Great. It's not that tune, but it is a Frischberg. Yeah, just some reworking of standards, a little more of the things that I would expect of myself. I also, as a bonus track, sing in Danish on one of the tunes. So this is something you acquired, of course, over the last 10 years. I assume by the time you met Morton, you didn't know Danish, right? I was glad <laughs> that I found out where Denmark was on the map. It's actually kind of a funny story with the song because uh, Summer Wind, which we really uh, affiliate so much more with uh, Frank Sinatra and, and so many people have done covers of that. Ray Brown's trio, Live at the Loa, swinging version of Summer Wind. I played it last summer. This goes back to Bornholm again. Played it, found out that originally it came from 1963 from Enschlagerfest. Like there was a German song competition in 1963 and the original version by Heinz Meyer was actually in German. There was a guy, I mean, just jazz fans. I love jazz fans because they will so hip you to stuff and do all this research and then, you know, show up at your gig and say, I, I did some research. I had to find out. So like apparently recorded that day in Danish and in German. Paulsbo wrote, recorded, or she wrote the, the Danish lyric, but it was recorded by Greta Engman, a famous Danish singer. And so she did the, the German and the Danish version on the same day. It didn't win the competition. Frank Sinatra ended up hearing it and wanted to sing it. So Johnny Mercer then put the American lyric on top of that. I actually do it in both English and then we have two different versions. We did one in Danish. Really cool. <laughs> Yeah, it's just kind of messing around. And I, I mean, changes wise, I mean, it's just swing or die and fun and kind of tips a hat a little bit to raise trio. That's why it's called straight ahead, right? Exactly. Mainstream. Swing along. That's what it was. Makes you dance. But what a cool story. So yeah, everybody should go and check out the versions when, when they come out pretty soon. Denmark and double releases and all new lives. You know, the last one we're going to listen to is This Is My Life, which is not the most most commonly known song but this is just a really nice gorgeous arrangement and I think this kind of condenses really well you know leaving everything and I did that too leaving everything behind and moving to a different country and figuring it out that takes a minute that happens in making that kind of a, a change is that that fear of the loss and there are certain things that we we lose to a degree to make these changes in our lives but I think ultimately it makes our world bigger to that we we don't lose the family especially with the technology we have now. Still not the same as going and having a cup of coffee with my mom, you know, and dad when we feel like it. And we did miss Christmas this year, not being able to travel, but we'll be back at it again soon. Yeah, this is my life. That was another one of Mia's uh, requests. Shirley Bassey 
And it just, it's a real, it's a deep lyric, but I really, I love the fact that it has that change between like the dark and the light. There's those struggles. And when you're having a down day, are you thinking, you know, what good is, what good is my life? What is, what am I about? Why am I here? And then, you know, that thing coming into the the chorus is, you know, this is me. We got Steen Nikolai Hansen on the trombone, who right. just plays beautifully on it. What a great way to to sum this up. So let's let's listen to This Is My Life from Kristen Korb's new album, The First Half, What If, and with Why Not coming out on the other side very soon. And thank you so much, Kristen, from, for tuning in from Denmark and sharing here a rainy a Sunday afternoon with us. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate it. It's great talking to you. And good luck with everything. We'll get it out there. Let's, let's get this music heard. It's beautiful. Funny how a lonely day can make a person say, what good is my life? Funny how a breaking heart can make me start to say, what good is my life? Funny how I seem to think I'll find another dream. Sometimes when I feel afraid, I think of what a mess I've made of my life. Crying over my mistakes, forgetting all the breaks I've had in my life. I was put on earth to be a part of this great world. It's me and my life.
Talking Jazz. My guest today was bassist, vocalist, educator, composer, Kristen Korb. Tune in for Talking Jazz every Thursday at 11 a.m. and every Monday at 7 p.m. right here on WETF 105.7 FM in South Bend, Indiana or online at wetfthejazzstation.org. Also find videos of previous shows on YouTube on the Monica Hersick channel. That's M-O-N-I-K-A-H-E-R-Z-I-G. Subscribe to get the newest updates. Thank you for listening.